that will remind me. <laughs> right. Growing beans. Grote had a theory that if you deliberately twisted the bean vines round the other way, that the beans would yield a greater proportion of beans to pods. In other words, that they would be uh, more economical. He wrote papers about this. I don't think he ever came up with data that proved his theory, but he was very keen on growing those vines. And you can see here some, some little notes. Now, they're not showing up all that well here, but you can see some of Grote's handwriting. Another thing that we are very grateful for is that Grote kept everything, all of his notes, every note that he had ever written through most of his life, he had kept. He even wrote down uh, things like uh, when he would send a film to be developed. He would write down the date, he would write down how much he paid, the number of the cheque, the date the film was returned. So we were able to track down a lot of Grote's history. Grote was also very keen on transport. He believed that it was a, one of the most important things to do to improve the efficiency of our transport. So he would ride his bike around Bothwell, bearing in mind that he was well into his 70s when he was doing this. Uh, and I think he was still riding a bike, or trying to, after he had turned 80. He would attach a motor to the front of the bike, called a bike bug, and he would test it. He would go around and make notes about the wind speed and how quickly he could drive ride down the street in his bicycle. And an observation that he made just before he died. And this is a very interesting one. How much does a car weigh? It's heavy. It takes a 2,000 pound car to move a 160 pound man. Have you ever thought about that? How heavy your car is compared to you? And it, most of the energy is being used to move the car, not the man inside. Grote was well aware of this, and he would experiment with different brands of car to see how efficient they were. He even imported Renault cars from Tahiti and tested them in Tasmania. He discovered, at least he thinks he got it right, that the best speed to drive these Renaults was 40 kilometres an hour. The road from the main highway to Bothwell was full of twists and turns. And when the local Bothwell people were trying to get home after a night out, the worst thing in the world was when they got stuck behind Grote Reaper. Because Grote would drive at 40 kilometres an hour and he, they couldn't pass him. But he gave up on the Renaults and built his own car. This is Grote's electric car called Pixie. And he decided that he would uh, build a car that was the most efficient car possible. And he would drive this around Bothwell as well. It was a major talking point in the community. One of the problems that Grote had was that he designed the back of the car to be aerodynamically perfect. And then, of course, the authorities told him he had to put a license plate on the car. That slowed him down, of course. So he redesigned it with a little window in the back and he was allowed to put his license plate in the rear window. As I've mentioned, Grote's house was fairly basic, but he did keep a lot of things. You can see here boxes and boxes full of material that he kept from over the years. His radio equipment, his notes. He would never throw anything away unless he absolutely had to. In one of these boxes, we found a packet of chicken soup. So he was very thrifty, was Grote. After Grote passed away, uh, I was one of the people involved in re removing the contents of Grote's house. We repacked them into literally hundreds of boxes full. And you can see here, uh, my planetarium, where I work, is inside a museum. You can see me lost amongst all of Grote's boxes there, which took months and months to catalogue. He kept every little piece, every screw, nut, bolt, resistor, valve. He kept used fluorescent lights and put dates on them to note when they had failed. But he didn't want to throw them away. So he kept boxes full of old fluorescent lights. We can see here a general view of Grote's house with his water tanks and the shed 
that he had moved to his house after he dismantled his radio array. The view inside the shed, showing his bicycle, and some wires hanging from the ceiling, metal shielding around the walls because he was working at radio wavelengths and he didn't want any uh, interruptions, any, any interference. And in uh, 2004, we had the shed removed. We bought the shed back from the new owners and transported it to Hobart and set it up near the university's radio observatory. That shed now forms part of the Grote Reba Museum, which contains a lot of Grote's possessions on display, together with a lot of information about radio astronomy. This is a, a picture of Grote that I took in 1995, uh, when he was 84 years old. I, I often visited him. Um, it was always a very interesting thing to do. It was very difficult to arrange to visit Grote. Uh, he didn't have a telephone because he didn't think it was necessary uh, and uh, partly because he didn't want to pay for one. He was very thrifty, remember? Um, so I would have to write him a letter to tell him I would like to come and see him. And he wrote me a letter back saying that he would like to see me, but he was really thrifty. He reused the same envelope and the same stamp um, and just readdressed the envelope back to me to save 30 cents. But he was an eccentric character in a way, but I miss him very much, I knew him very well, and here is one of the last photographs ever taken of him when he turned 90 in 2001. Grote passed away two days before his 91st birthday. He has a, a long list of radio observations that he made. I won't bother reading through all of those in great detail because we're probably running short of time but he demonstrated the non-thermal nature of radio noise from the galaxy down earlier. I've noted that he detected solar radio bursts. He had many prizes, including the Bruce Medal from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, an honorary doctorate of science from Ohio State University. And his legacy is that radio astronomy is now a very, very important field of astronomy around the world. He opened a new window to the universe. Never before had anybody seen the universe outside the visible light, outside the visible wavelengths. Grote, Grote's legacy is that we now study radio galaxies, quasars, pulsars, the cosmic microwave background, of course, which relates to the Big Bang and even interstellar molecules. And for those of you who are into astronomy, you will know, of course, that there are many other things that radio astronomers do. Uh, one of the more unusual things is that we are spreading Grote's ashes in little boxes around the world. I am the administrator of this medal, which is the world's gold medal for radio astronomy, and Grote's face is on one side, a picture of his radio telescope is on the other. Govin Swarup, who of course is from India, and some of you might know of Govin. Uh, he has devoted a lot of his life to the field of radio astronomy, very, very active and we considered him a very worthy recipient of the Grote Reba Medal. And I'll be, I'm delighted that I'll be going to see Govind again next week. So Grote Reba was really a remarkable character. He went against mainstream ideas and did things by himself. He didn't always get the science right, but his observations were landmark observations. They really set the scene for what was to come a lot later. I wish that you had all got to know Grote Reba. He was a remarkable man and an inspiration to us all. Uh, would, uh, can maybe uh, be reminded of Professor Goin uh, Sarup's Reba Medal. The, his, I think he's a little bit considered the father of radio astronomy, Sarup, today. It was very inspiring. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You very much.